Did you notice Salt and Sacrifice quietly release onto the Nintendo Switch a couple of days ago? Well, I certainly did. I was a massive fan of Salt and Sanctuary, so I was keen to see what they did with the sequel. Now, I'm aware that when it came out on PC, there were quite a few issues with the game, so I'll be addressing those because actually they've changed quite a bit from its original PC release. What you might not know about this fan favourite Souls-like is that it's developed by a team called Scar Studios, which actually consists of a husband and wife duo, James and Michelle Silver, with numerous changes to its gameplay design and some quite ambitious moves. Does it live up to or exceed Salt and Sanctuary, or have they made one too many sacrifices? Well, my name's Mark Walker, welcome back to Switch Up, now let's find out. In Salt and Sanctuary, you play as a criminal. You even get to choose what your crime was, and the penance which you must pay means that you have to become a mage hunter, traipsing through this grimy world, eliminating powerful mages until you've paid the price as your punishment. An interesting concept for sure, and certainly a lot more coherent than a lot of Souls likes. Fans of the original game will initially feel right at home. You can create your character from a number of different classes, some of those will focus on close-ranged attacks like the Rogue, my personal choice, while others are better suited at range. Your new home is set within a kingdom called Altarstone, and it is blighted by those twisted mages, whom the Marked Inquisitors, the group of condemned warriors you're a part of, are tasked with hunting down and killing. Unlike Salt and Sanctuary, this isn't one large open world. You have a main hub area, from which you can craft different weapons, use the salt that you've gained to upgrade your character, raising their level and in turn gaining several points for one of the biggest skill trees I've ever seen. Honestly, it was a bit overwhelming initially, until I realised that it was simply splitting out the different weapons and overall build types into its different regions. With each level you choose to gain, you'll also gain a point for this tree, and each enemy you defeat will gain you some more salt, but if you fall in combat, then you're going to have to return to your body, you know the drill, and get it back. Now, aside from the hub area, you can actually leave to new locations, of which there are around five, and you'll be doing that through the rune gate. This is quite cool. You'll learn new rune destinations, punch those in, and then hop into the portal. And for those wanting jolly cooperation, yep, you can do that here. You'll just have to give your friend the code, which will be a series of runes, which is a nice idea. The day we get a Souls-like that just has a matchmaking system like every other game will be one that makes me truly happy. Still, it works and it does make sense, I guess. The five large areas are truly massive, and Salt and Sanctuary has a much faster pace than its predecessor. You'll still be dealing with health and stamina, but unless I'm going completely bonkers, I couldn't see the previous parry mechanic. What I can see though are a few quality of life additions that have actually been added in after they were initially removed from this game. One of those is fast travel. When it first launched, they'd for some perplexing reason removed the fast travel system. It meant that you had to backtrack through entire areas and it just wasn't very fun. You'll see why that's so important in a minute. Now you can rest at shrines, which will restore your potions and your ranged gear and thankfully fast travel to any of these that you've found within an area. The Metroidvania element will see you gaining different items to allow for new ways of traversing. Things like a grappling hook, meaning you can reach different areas within all of those different lands. But the big game-changing mechanic this time around is the hunting of those mages. It's really quite unusual when you first experience it. You'll come across what amount as missions to go and hunt them. When you select this, the mage's location will be marked with a black misty thing. Yeah, that one. And following its general direction and trajectory will take you on the hunt. Now, occasionally you'll actually see the mage and it might be fighting other enemies in the game. You can wade in and do a bit of damage to it, causing it to then disappear and move on to the next area. This takes place several times until eventually you've tracked it down, the walls will shut on both sides and you've got yourselves a traditional Souls-like boss fight. The bosses in this game are excellent. They're absolutely grotesque, they have patterns that you can learn, but they never felt insurmountable. A lot of people didn't like this mage hunting mechanic. It can just feel a little bit at odds with the rest of the game, because there are still boss fights in here. You'll still find random large hulking enemies that you can take on, as well as secret areas, but I guess they just wanted to do something a little bit different. Now I mentioned the fast travel, and this is where it comes into play. It's so important. Previously you might have made your way across the entire stage fighting those bosses, and then die and have to 
walk all the way back again, now you can actually fast travel. Another thing they've changed is it also didn't used to replenish those health files when you died, at least not in the mage hunt, and I'm pretty positive that that is now the case. It means that while I can still understand sometimes those mage battles being a little odd and slightly frustrating, they're much easier than they once were, and actually I quite enjoy them. If there's one thing I am sick of, it is just rinse and repeat the same formula. Sure, Souls likes are fun, but why not try something different, and that's what they've done here. Combining those Metroidvania elements, alongside the hunting of those monsters, and when you get someone along for jolly cooperation, it really is good fun. Is it as good as the first game? I'm going to say no, and the reason for that is it doesn't quite maintain that same sense of otherness that that game had. You'd walk out, and within a few moments feel entirely isolated and alone, and quite weak and defenceless. That wasn't necessarily the case, but it was the atmosphere and the vibe that was created. It's not quite the same here. You feel much stronger, you're faster. It's just a very different style experience. But grinding up the bones of those corrupted mages and turning them into various different types of weapons is very cool. And you can also turn some of their power into runic arts, which are unique magical abilities. The controls are actually surprisingly responsive. Rolling around, blocking, using those ranged moves, it all feels really nice, especially on the Switch when it's running this well. Gameplay might not appeal to everyone. If you go in expecting just Salt and Sanctuary 2, there's a chance that you might not like some of those new gameplay elements. But hopefully this review will help with that. Now for me, I think it's decent and I enjoy the fact that they've tried something different, even if it doesn't entirely come off. It's still a really fun Souls-like and I give gameplay 17 out of 20. As for the controls, well, they also score 17 out of 20. On the performance front, things are looking great on the Switch. You're looking at 60 frames per second. It's very smooth and I haven't experienced any bugs. It really feels like they've put the work in to get things working nicely. The visual style, well, it has that inverse kinematic animation, like when you used to rig models with a bone tool, and it's certainly an acquired taste. The world doesn't feel quite as atmospheric as the old one. Again, that could be linked more to the gameplay and the overall speed and skill your character has at the beginning. It's not to say it's bad. It still looks great and there are some really nice areas. I thought the monster designs were excellent. Some of them really are grotesque. They also have nice AI and can traverse the different ledges and areas. And I think it was James Silver who did the artwork here, the same guy that did it on the first game, with an excellent returning audio artist as well in McLean Deemer, who has composed another excellent soundtrack. Without sounding like a broken record, I'm going to give both visuals and audio 17 out of 20. I'd say an average first run of Sword and Sacrifice is going to take you around 20 to 25 hours. Then you've got to remember that you can go back and try all the different character classes. And if you want to get all the armors and the different mage hunts, push that to 30 to 40 hours. Plus, you've got the online modes to come back for. And in fairness, it is more fun with a friend, particularly with that hunting mechanic. Price-wise, it's £17.59 or your regional equivalent, which seems more than reasonable for the amount of gameplay you're getting and the effort they've clearly put into this port. I can't see anything about a physical on Switch at the moment, but I think the value will be affected by how people engage with those new mechanics. As I said, they won't appeal to everyone. I give value 16 out of 20. Inquisitors come to the Veil to seek purpose in their punishment. Initially, I really wasn't sure about Salt and Sacrifice. Its new direction wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but actually the changes they've made since it originally came out on PC have done a lot to mitigate some of those complaints. I do think it's very good and well worth checking out if you're a fan of the genre. It gets a switch up score of 84%. So there we have it. Let me know how you uh, got on with that review. Got on with it? What am I talking about? Did you enjoy it is what I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks to all of you that enjoy the content, to our Patreons and members, and as always, for all things Switch, all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers, guys. See you!